Now, does this matter? Does this matter at all? Yes, because it bugs me personally. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Hello, it's me, internet personality Laura Crone, here to answer some of your questions for me about me. Yay. I recently hit a little bit of a milestone. Very exciting. Uh, so I thought we would just do something fun. All right, let's do this. Questions. Chip Olive asks, what brought you to the decision to take the jump and start making YouTube videos? A rant that needed to be made, an opinion of yours you wanted to share, or simply an artistic desire of some sort? What was your inciting action of sorts? Uh, so I got a few uh, versions of this question. The simple version of the answer is I realized I was already writing video essay scripts. I was just doing it in like, text messages to my friends and to my sisters who like didn't care <laughs> and were humoring me very kindly. But I think almost more important was how I stuck with it, which really just came out of the fact that um, I had moved at the beginning of 2017, I moved to Los Angeles. So I was planning to, you know, try and be in movies as an actress and as a stunt performer, just kind of like try to do both of those and see which one took off. What I think I kind of knew, but hadn't really thought through before I actually moved was that especially in a town as big as LA with like, it's actually the main industry here. Most of the time that you spend when you're new in town working on that kind of career is not doing the thing at all. After most of a year of, like, just kind of spinning my wheels and trying to get someone to notice me and get me in the room with the people who would eventually get me the job, um, I just, I just, I had been doing so much work to try to get creative work, but I had no like actual creative outlet of my own. And so moving into this project where it's like, you know, maybe nobody watches the video, but nobody gets to tell me that I can't do it. Like nobody has to give me permission. No one has to hire me to make a YouTube video. Like literally all that happens is I decide I want to do it and then I do the work and do it. And at the end, like, Worst case scenario, I have a video that 12 people watch. That's kind of, I think, what's really kept me going is just like, it's a creative outlet that no one has to give me permission to do. Costanza Palastri, I'm so sorry if I butchered your name, uh, asks, how does it feel to have an audience? Are you the kind of person who enjoys reading comments slash mentions? Why? Uh, for the most part, having an audience feels pretty great. Uh, I think that is largely because my audience is currently a really pleasant size. Uh, so I'm still very much... 10,000 subscribers is a great level for catching the attention only of people who are like kind of interested in what you're doing. I have this massive contrast between most of the videos on my channel and two of my videos that have like actually gotten picked up by the algorithm and the difference in the comments is just like so much. I generally feel like I'm I'm much more interested in having like a small engaged audience than I am in having like a big audience and specifically like a small audience who are like engaged enough to like give me monetary support to where I don't have to have a day job. Like that's much more important to me than having like a big audience. Twelve Tone asks, if you had infinite time and money to make whatever video you wanted to make with a guaranteed million views waiting once it was finished, what would it be about? This is another question that I got uh, several forms of. And the interesting thing that I'm realizing the more people ask me this question is that in terms of like video essays, I am still very much in a place where like the limiting factor is my own time and my ideas. So I'm still having a ton of fun with video essays, just like working within the confines of my super low budget and working within the confines of I'm still learning a lot of things about how to do all of the filmmaking stuff. Um, and every new project is like, okay, I get to learn something new. Um, so as far as video essays, I feel like I, I'm actually very happy with sort of 
where I'm at right now. Like, I don't feel like I have any ideas that I can't make with the resources I have right now. But that's not true of videos in general. So I recently read uh, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor by Hank Green, and there is a fight scene in that book that I would love so much to stage and create, like, sort of a short fan film actually staging this fight, um, but there are a lot of problems there. Um, it, it has a piece of music to it, which is really fun to fight to, but um, that would be, like, it would definitely mean licensing it. Um, I am picturing, like, these great, like, Lee Whannell motion control camera movements, which is, like, super expensive, obviously. Um, and then there's the problem that it is definitely not safe in Los Angeles to film a fight scene with other humans right now. Um, so yeah, someday if you, if you gave me a million dollars and all of the access to everything, uh, that's, that's what I would love to do. To a related point, Alex asks, what topics have you scrapped that you really wish you could have made into videos? Um, so I have a lot of scripts that I've kind of started and just haven't got anywhere with, mostly because it's just like the idea is kind of half-baked and it's not really there. Um, so I don't consider any of them scrapped, I just consider them, like, I haven't really found what I'm actually doing with them yet, and maybe I'll circle back someday. But the one that, uh, I'm really just sitting on not because I feel like it's not there, or I feel like I don't have whatever, um, is I have, like, two-thirds of a draft written about, uh, the character Sarah Harding from The Lost World, uh, the Jurassic Park sequel, but, uh, who's gonna watch that? So I, I feel like I'm sitting on that one until such time as, like, maybe someday in the future I have enough of an audience that I really feel like I can just take a month to, like, make a video that maybe a lot of people won't want to see, but, like, enough of my audience will just watch it anyway. So that's that's the project that, uh, coming to you maybe someday soon. Maybe that'll be my 100,000 subscriber special. Michael Galusic asks, if there was to be an Oompa Loompa song about the ironic death of your favorite literary villain, how would it go? Mike. Mike, 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 you can't ask me this question 12 hours before I film the video. This is gonna take- this is gonna take some consideration. So what I'm gonna do is not answer this question right now and think about it over the next several weeks as I edit this video and, uh, stick around to the credits to see if I come up with anything good. <laughs> Matt asks, what are your favorite pastimes? I love this question because it's really made me question what I do that counts as a pastime because I feel like there are things that I would typically count as hobbies that are definitely not pastimes. Like, aerial dance is definitely not a pastime. Reading books, that's a pastime that I like, I think. Cooking, I think, counts as a pastime even though I did do it professionally for a while, but I don't anymore and I'm not planning on it, so that that feels like a pastime with those conditions. Hiking? I think hiking's a pastime. If I did it, like, any more seriously than I do, then I think it probably wouldn't, but I think the level where I'm at, which is like, give me a good solid medium on all trails, that, that feels like a pastime. Oh, playing the piano. Yeah, that's a pastime that I like. I, I don't have a piano right now, so I don't do it very much. God, <laughs> who has a piano? Who can afford to have a piano? Ah, that's the dream, right? The dream is just to live somewhere and be solid enough that I can that I can just buy a piano. That'd be great. K.E. Clark asks, do you have any pets? No, I want to adopt a dog so badly, um, but it's really difficult to do in LA. Not even because of, like, the space or anything, but just because, like, most apartments, like, I'd say a good 50% of apartments is just, like, a blanket, no dogs. In order to adopt a dog, which I hope to do at some point, I'm gonna have to move to a whole new apartment and basically make the point of my apartment search that I want to live somewhere where I can get a dog, uh, and I'm just not in a place to do that yet. So that I think that'll be how I know I'm a true adult will be that I'll be ready to adopt a dog. Kaya asks, has your time on YouTube as a creator changed your view of the platform or the way you use it as a viewer? The silliest little thing is that I pay a lot of attention to where mid-roll ads are placed. Um, it's kind of like I'm always trying to figure out, like, <laughs> are these here because 
YouTube placed them or did this person place them themselves? Valentina asks, what pieces of media have you found yourself coming back to or fixated on during quarantine? Maybe for comfort or not. This will surprise no one uh, as my next couple of months of videos come out, actually. Number one is I've been watching a lot more horror movies. I have found them comforting in a way that I never have in my life before. So I would say in the last six months, I have watched more horror movies, like alone and of my own volition, that I have in my entire life up to this point. And specifically, I have been particularly drawn to Ready or Not. I've watched that movie, like, so many times. Anything by Aaron Sorkin, especially The Social Network, I find just incredibly, like, comforting, and it's, it's like meeting an old friend and I have a lot of complicated feelings about that. The other big one is this visual novel called Arcade Spirits. I have damn near 100%ed it at this point. It's a delight and it makes me feel better about everything. Barbara Ruivo, sorry if I butchered that, asks, what's your favorite book? Franny and Zoe by J.D. Salinger and Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by Samin Nasrat two favorites for two occasions. Depressed Goblin Nightmare Boy asks, favorite band or artist? Also related, what music do you use for like writing and brainstorming? What I use for writing and brainstorming is very kind of dependent on my mood. Like I don't really have specific music for writing that's different from what I listen to other times. The only exception being if I am trying to do like a push like really just knock out a draft, uh, then it's the Matrix soundtrack. The, the, all of the Matrix soundtracks all the way, all night. Other music in general, I've talked about Guster before, Robert DeLong. I've used some Brett Domino slash Rob J. Madden music in some videos. That's, that's, uh, I really like, uh, both of those personas of the same person. Powder Paint. Powder paint's great. Just lately, I've been super into Junior Junior. The Baka That Chews asks, what inspired you to go into stunt work and who's your favorite stunt performer? Um, so my journey getting into stunt work um, really started when I was in acting school. I met really, really cool people and I really kind of like found my people in stage combat class in a way that I hadn't before. Um, and also like I had loved swords forever. like. I, I wanted to be Inigo Montoya when I was like eight years old, so it was like all of a sudden, like I literally, I got to, for one of my SPTs, I got to be Inigo Montoya and kill Count Ruby, and it was super just kind of living out this dream, and by the time that I graduated college, I really kind of felt like, screw this acting stuff, I just want to fight. There is no real career for being on stage and just being a fighter, but there is in film, you can be a stunt performer. Um, so that started to be a dream that I had and it was one that I circled back to once I started to feel like I was kind of hitting a wall in my sort of like small town community theater uh, community. Sofia Alvarenga, uh, apologies if I butchered that, says, hi, just wanted to know if there will be more stunt related videos and also what would you like to do when the pandemic is under control? More stunt related videos? Absolutely. I don't have any specifically planned right now, but yeah, definitely. Uh, that's something I love and I'll definitely talk more about it. When the pandemic is under control, just the number one thing that I miss so much is uh, aerial classes. I haven't gotten to take a class in a long time. I am lucky enough to have like a little setup in my backyard just for conditioning, but I don't have anything that I could actually rig up like an actual apparatus. Um, so I really, really miss that so much. I miss going to the movies. Oh, and uh, kissing. Kissing. I miss kissing. XJW SJW wants to know my hottest Star Wars take. So I thought I didn't have one of these. Um, and then the more I thought about it, this is another script that I've started writing and scrapping is, uh, James Earl Jones's line delivery on No, I Am Your Father is absolute fucking garbage and I can prove it with facts and logic. The reason is that it's antithesis. Antithesis is when you have two phrases that are kind of set against one another and there's a contrast or a comparison. And so when you have antithesis, you want to hit 
the operative word, and the operative word is the word where that comparison or that contrast happens. God, every time I try to come up with an example, all I can think of are like these prayers from the Episcopal Church, uh, so forgive me for that, uh, but like, grant that what we sing with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and what we believe in our hearts we may show forth in our lives. So there's a, there's a contrast set there. So when you have this line, I am your father, that's actually a direct antithesis against what Luke has said uh, before, which is, uh, he told me enough, he told me you killed him. So you killed him, I am your father. So those are set against one another. Luke knows when he says you killed him that Darth Vader has some relationship to his father, and the surprise is that that relationship is that he is his father. That operative word where the contrast is, is uh, I am your father. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. Now, does this matter? Does this matter at all? Yes, because it bugs me personally. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Blaze Utz says, I loved seeing you in the World's Elsewhere production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Thanks. Uh, any plans for showing up in their future productions or other projects like that? Yes, uh, October 24th, we're doing Lysistrata. It's gonna be a good time. Mark your calendar. Hey, editing Laura here. Uh, that date has obviously passed, but the show is archived on YouTube if you still want to check it out. And you'll be able to see me in Julius Caesar on March 20th. Links are in the description. Uh, check out the show, subscribe to the World's Elsewhere channel. Classics Lover asks, have you designed your own personal superhero costume in your head? What would your superhero name be? So I've mentioned on this channel before that my superhero alter ego is named Blue Sparkle Barbie. She has been my alter ego since I was five years old and wrote a play about her. She wears this kind of like blue spandexy thing with uh, lots and lots of sparkles and a uh, little cape. Do you rock climb to get used to heights and rigging? No, the big thing that I do uh, to practice height, get used to heights and rigging and also air awareness is aerial stuff. So that's kind of what I do instead. And that did, I actually did get into that um, through uh, via stunts. Like, I went to stunt school and a lot of the aerial work I didn't feel like I was good at. Uh, not I didn't feel like, like I was bad at it. And I noticed that the people who were good at it were people who were aerialists, and so I took a couple classes thinking that it would just be like a thing I would do to get better at stunt work, um, and then I just absolutely fell in love with it in and of itself. So I haven't been up in a stunt harness in a long time, but, uh, you know, before the pandemic, at least, I was taking a hoop or hammock class, uh, like, once or twice a week. What's your favorite recipe for fake blood? Uh, I don't have one. I just, I just buy it. Do you plan out your approach if you suddenly have to beat up your date? I've never planned how I would beat up a date, but I have absolutely looked around and, like, figured out how I would make a quick exit if I needed to. Like, I would say that most rooms I've ever been in, I have looked around and figured out like how I would climb up somewhere. Not even necessarily like out of a desire to get away from someone, just because like the, I, my brain is it's just like something that's always running in the background in my brain. What's your favorite weapon? My favorite existing weapon is there is a sword in the Mets Arms and Armory collection, um, which if you go to NYU, um, my experience there anyway was that like once a month, one of your teachers or the other sends you to go do a project where you have to go to the Met. It would just be like, I once again find myself in the arms and armory room. And there's one particular sword that was on display there uh, that is, I shit you not, a serrated broadsword. So that's my plan for the zombie apocalypse is raid the Met and get me that serrated broadsword and just take some zombies down. Are you starting to be on a first name basis with the emergency room personnel? No, thankfully. Did Adam of Adam and Eve fame have a belly button? You know, I think it is important and good to admit when you have no knowledge of something. So I'm just gonna say creationist biology, totally out of my field. I have no idea. Do you know? Tell me in the comments. Brianne Kennedy asks, what would your ideal style be if you could redo your wardrobe however you liked? I don't know if I would really change anything. The biggest thing that's happened with my style actually has been this, uh, this dark lipstick. That was something, like, makeup in general was something that for 
a lot of my life I felt really uncomfortable with. And it's only been like in the last few years that I've started really feeling comfortable just like wearing lipstick and just kind of being like, I like this color of lipstick and I feel like wearing lipstick today, so I'm gonna do it. I have a pure blue lipstick that's in my bag that I haven't worked up the guts to really wear anywhere. So uh, maybe one of these days, maybe one of these days you'll see it in a video. Chris Davis asks, why did you do the MCU series you're in the middle of? Like, what brought it on? It is really, like, close to the way that I described it in that video. I, I think it was actually when I saw Age of Ultron that I really started thinking. I mean, that was long before I started making video essays. For a long time, it was just like, oh, maybe I'll make, like, a blog post or something someday. So yeah, it's really just, like, a project that I've wanted to do in some form for, like, years. And uh, once I started making YouTube videos, I think I knew pretty soon after I started my channel, like, oh, this could be a good home for this. And it was just kind of a matter of like waiting for the right moment. And then what brought it on specifically in the moment was just kind of, I started feeling ready to write the script. Would you ever consider applying your critical lens to video games? Yes, stay tuned. If you had to pick an animated film as your favorite, what would it be? Wally. -E. It's Wally. -E. Uh, I remember seeing the first trailer for that in front of like Finding Nemo, I think, um, and just turning to my sister and being like, that's me! <laughs> like, I don't think I even really knew what I meant, and I still don't really, but like, oh, like that's me. Wally. Love Wally. Austin Sears asks, who are your favorite characters for each Enneagram type? Well, Austin, I am kind of making a series about this right now. Uh, but if we're going outside the scope of just the MCU, I'd say one, Diane Nguyen, two, Paula Proctor, three, Rebecca Bunch, four, Bojack Horseman, five, Abed Nadir, six, Chidi Anagonye, as I mentioned in that video, uh, seven, Mr. Peanut Butter, <laughs> eight, Madeline from Big Little Lies, I can't remember her last name. Um, and specifically the character she is in the book, I'm less familiar with the show, so I don't know if she makes it there in the form that I'm familiar with her as. Um, but yeah, Madeline from Big Little Lies. Nine, Todd Chavez. I'm rewatching Bojack Horseman right now, can you tell? Name Cannot Be Blank asks, if you had to distribute the Enneagram, the Zodiac, Myers-Briggs, and Harry Potter on the D&D alignment chart, where would you put them? Uh, so I may be biased, but I would put Enneagram as neutral good. Uh, I just, it's just like super touchy-feely. Like, the Enneagram just wants you to like, be a better person and be the best person that you can be and like, have more empathy for the world. And so that feels very like, neutral good to me. Other ones I know less about. So Myers-Briggs, I feel like from my experience, I would put it as lawful neutral because it kind of feels like it's very analytical and like you, you take the test and you've got these, these four distinct like binaries, um, or not necessarily binaries, but like these four sliding scales and you have a quantifiable place on each of them. The Zodiac, I, I know, I know so little about astrology, probably because every time I read anything about my astrological sign, it's like, you're a homebody and you cry a lot. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like me. Chaotic neutral? And then Harry Potter houses, I'm gonna call chaotic evil, not just because Joanne is who she is these days, but also just like, in general, like it's, it, it just feels so much revisiting those stories. Like it's just an extra justification for why the heroes are good and the villains are bad. Not to mention that like this idea of like, there are four kinds of people in the world. There's brave, smart, kind, and ambitious. It's just like, that's just such a clusterfuck of a taxonomy. So I'm gonna call it chaotic evil. K.E. Clark asks, has your favorite movie changed? Or at least what you tell people is your favorite movie. I feel like I've been on a run where if someone asks, I usually say Thor Ragnarok. But I also really like this idea that Breadsword brought up in his most recent video of asking, what's your favorite movie right now? And I think my favorite movie right now is Alien. Ellie Spectacular asks, do you feel as though we, the critics and essayists, actively contribute to the fusion of art and competition that capitalism created? If that's a bad thing, what can we do to counter it? This is such a huge question and I feel like I just honestly lack the capacity to really tackle it. Something that I have been thinking about a lot um, 
as I've been thinking about this question is um, sort of the choice of what material to cover as an essayist. Um, and this is something that I struggle with um, being someone who does mostly talk about relatively commercially successful stuff. And the question of like, what am I really doing by like continuing to make that feel like this cultural thing that you have to be a part of. And I do think that's something that kind of contributes to the sort of monopolistic nature of art that's only happening more and more, especially in cinema. I did make the one video about Nobody, which is a movie I assumed no one in my audience had seen. And that was hard also because I couldn't even recommend it. So it's like, what am I even doing <laughs> here? Uh, and then there's the extra question of like, then, okay, now it's streaming on Amazon. And I was actually feeling like weirdly conflicted about recommending it to people and like letting them know that they could see it because it's like, it's exclusively on Amazon. And so you have to give your money to this mega corporation to see this movie that I really do feel like people should watch, but it's, it's really, really difficult to kind of parse um, what we're doing in this in this capitalist landscape. Like how how much are we helping that and how much are we just kind of existing in that world um, is, a, is a really difficult question. K.E. Clark asks, have you seen Baby Driver? Yes. K.E. Clark asks, have you seen Glee? Uh, the first and a half season? Matt Crowley asks, would you like some ketchup? I'm gonna say probably not. I keep ketchup around all of the time, uh, but mostly just uh, to have it as like a component of better sauces. Like if you're gonna make a comeback sauce, you need some ketchup. I am a big fan of like some days I am just having a feeling that like the only solution is like a nice white bread American cheese, grilled cheese sandwich, super buttery with like a plate of shoestring fries. And like, then I want ketchup with my fries, but like 90% of the time, no, sorry, Matt, I don't really want that ketchup. David J. Bradley, asexual simp asks, definitive sword ranking? Do not ask me to choose between my children, David. But I, I did think it would be kind of fun to um, just, just tell you a little about all of these swords that uh, you see in the background of my videos. So this, this is a cold steel katana. It is uh, a form of a boken. It is made of plastic. Um, it's very solid. So this is just a training piece. So like, let me preface this by saying like, if you're looking to get into sword fighting, like the money you should invest should be in training, not in equipment. But if you are looking for like a good purchase, like if you are starting to get some training, like these, these are like 30 bucks. And this is like the single most useful, like value for money purchase I think that I've ever made in the stunt realm. This is what we would call a theatrical saber. Um, so this is made entirely of fencing parts. So this is an epee blade with a saber grip. Small swords are really expensive. So if you're looking for like a cheap way to, uh, sort of emulate a small sword without actually purchasing a good small sword. Um, this is what you want to do. So yeah, this is another one that's like super versatile, super good for training. So this is, um, I, I would call it a broadsword. It's a little short for a broadsword, but a short sword is a totally different thing. She is, she's aluminum. I bought this at the Ohio Renaissance Fair and buying this sword was like one of my favorite things that has ever happened to me it happened which was it was i got it from this stall at the renaissance fair um where they had like i knew that they had some good stuff but they also had a lot of crap that was just there so that like you could wear it while you were there and look cool um so i was like walking around this stall and they had just like racks and racks of swords and i was like, picking up every individual one and like kind of holding it as, mu as much as they would let you. Like they really won't let you do much. And this guy behind the counter is like, oh, you seem to have a discerning eye. What are you looking for? And I was like, I'm looking for something I can use. And like five men around me all like took a giant step back. But then this guy behind the counter just hands this over like from his store back there. And he's like, here, all you had to do was ask. And yeah, this is a, this is a lovely, lovely sword. Um, it's a little, it's a little blade heavy for my taste. Um, but because it's pretty light, um, it's still very, 
wieldable with one hand. And also this sheath is really cool and versatile. Like I can wear it around my waist or over my back, which is really cool. This is my rapier. This rapier is long enough that I, I have some trouble with drawing it. Uh, can I get the tip in frame? Yeah. This also came from the Ohio Renaissance Fair, same place. This was, I actually bought this one first, which was how I knew that they had some good stuff. So this is a sprung steel rapier. So it's a little less heavy than some other steel weapons. Um, but what's more important to me is that uh, this big old basket hilt uh, is so nice and heavy that as big as this sword is and as long as it is, like it balances like a dream. I call this one my six fingered sword because it makes me feel like Inigo Montoya uh, with this big, beautiful, uh, lovely, fun thing, even just to wear on my hip when I get the chance. And when I got that rapier, actually, I also got uh, this Mangoche dagger with it. It feels a little too small and a little too light. Uh, with that particular sword, but just in general, uh, having a having a dagger is good. Oh, and then I also have my shield. My shield is hiding. This came from uh, Tony Swatton at uh, Sword in the Stone here in LA. Cool, that was my Q&A. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking around. 10,000 people said they want to see my videos. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Thanks for being one of them. I'm glad that I got to celebrate it here with all of you today. Thank you. Okay, the moment you've all been waiting for. Oompa loompa doopity doo. I've got a perfect puzzle for you. Oompa loompa doopity dee. If you are wise, you'll listen to me. What do you get when you try to steal eggs? Can't make your own, so you nab in Jen's dregs. Fail at it once, then come back for round two. Harding knows what to do with you feed you to a dinosaur oompa loompa doopity da if you're not a capitalist you could go far you will live in happiness too like the oompa loompa doopity do <laughs> anyway thank you so much to my patrons for paying me to do weird stuff like this. Uh, there's actually an extended cut of this video over on my Patreon, so if you would like to know even more about me, you can join these lovely folks, including Andreas Evans, Ben Demery, Danny, Exceedingly Lizzie, Kaya, Ella Milktray, Michelle, Richard Lawson, and Ronnie Rocket.